Marcus here. Now I want to remind everybody of our pact that for every 1,000 subscribers I receive on this channel, I will give away one copy of Cyberlink's PowerDirector 13 Ultra software. So please consider liking this video, sharing it, subscribing, or even just listening to the very end. One of the fundamental problems in philosophy, as well as in day-to-day -day life, is the problem which is the subject of the philosophical discipline known as epistemology. It is the problem of knowledge. How is it that we come to know anything? How are we justified in making knowledge claims? What justifies us in holding the beliefs that we do? And how can we demonstrate this justification? The internet, if nothing else, is the perpetual battleground of epistemology. The meme that best describes this sentiment can be observed in the comic of a man talking to his wife. And there is a voice bubble above this man's head. And in the voice bubble is the text, I can't come to bed now. Someone on the internet is wrong. You see, this sense of righteousness permeates our very being, and it offends us to have someone spewing nonsense in our presence. The first line of Book 1 of Aristotle's Metaphysics says, All thinking men, by nature, desire to know. But how do we know that we know? In Plato's dialogue entitled Theotetus, Socrates is engaged in a dialogue with a young man named Theotetus. The substantial question that is posed in this dialogue is, what is knowledge? After many rounds of attempting to come to a definition, uh, each round succumbing to the Yelankis, we are left with a definition that, though not completely problem-free, has been a very influential definition in epistemology. The dialogue closes with the definition that knowledge is justified true belief. Now, let us break down this definition to see what it means. As knowledge is asserted to be possible, and that men can possess knowledge, then it follows that knowledge is a thing possessed by man. As such, knowledge is some form of belief that is held by a man. Now, what sort of belief is it? Well, it cannot be said that an object of knowledge can be false, therefore it must be true. As such, the belief must be a true belief. Finally, we must consider how a belief can be true. Well, a true belief would surely be justifiable. As such, it would be a justified true belief. Now, let us quickly explore the difference between a true belief and a justified true belief. A man may possess a true belief, such as the world is round. Now, most of us hold this true belief, as I would suspect that there are probably many children out there who do not hold any belief as to the nature of the world. But, at the same time, very few of us are justified in holding this belief which is not to say the belief is not justified, but that we, as individuals, are not justified in holding this belief. You see, under this account, a man possesses knowledge not only if his belief is true, but that he knows why it is true and can recite the justification for it. However, by asserting that the world is round, most of us also feel like we possess the justification for this assertion namely, that it is a scientific fact. Okay, let me ask you this. If I told you that I believe that the world is flat, you would look at me like an idiot and most likely ask me why I believe this. If I were to tell you that I believe the world is flat because my brother told me it is flat, you would dismiss this reasoning as silly. But why? After all, I have come to accept the belief that the world is flat based on the exact same grounds as virtually all of you listening have accepted the statement that the world is round. We both accepted testimony as our justification. I am sure that none of you have seen the earth from orbit, nor have you done the necessary experiments to verify the claim that the world is round. So, as the claims that the world is flat and that the world is round are in contradiction, yet both use testimony as justification, we cannot claim testimony as valid justification for holding either belief. So in this way, someone who holds the claim that the world is round holds a true belief, but not a justified true belief, and as such does not possess knowledge of the status of the shape of the earth. Okay, clearly only one claim about the shape of the earth can be true. It is either round or flat in this example as we have come to see that testimony is not a valid justification, well, at least not in the strictest sense, then what is valid justification? Well, now we come to the regress argument. 
the regress argument goes as follows. For a belief A to be considered knowledge, it must be a justified true belief. The only thing that can justify A is another justified true belief. Let us call it B. But in order for B to justify A, then we must know the justification of B. The only thing that can justify B is a justified true belief. The justification to B will then be the justified true belief C. And this can go on until the end of time. Now, how can we resolve this seemingly infinite regress? Well, let us explore some possible ways that this regress can play itself out. 1. The regress carries on forever, which makes it an infinite regress. 2. The regress terminates in a false belief. 3. The regress becomes circular. Uh, we see this in the following case. I believe A because I believe B. I believe B because I believe C. And I believe C because I believe A. 4. The regress terminates in a basic belief. Okay, now we clearly know that if a regress carries on into infinity, then the belief that triggered such a regress cannot be justified. Therefore, the belief cannot be knowledge. We also know that circular reasoning is also logically fallacious. Finally, we know that if the justification for belief A ends in a false belief, then belief A is false. This leaves us with the last option, that the regress terminates in a basic belief. Now, what is a basic belief then? Well, this is a belief that is so fundamental that by its very nature, a basic belief is self-justifying. Particular beliefs that can be given the privilege of being called basic beliefs you know, are a matter of contention amongst philosophers. But I would posit that if no other belief can be called a self-justified basic belief, then Aristotle's law of non-contradiction is such a belief. The law of non-contradiction being that a belief A and its opposite, not A, cannot both be true. So either Santa Claus exists or he does not. Only one of these beliefs can be true, and if one is true, then the other is false. Now, when you accept that a basic belief, a self-justifying belief, is the correct solution to the regress argument, then you have in effect adopted an epistemological theory called foundationalism. Foundationalism is the oldest theory of justification in epistemology. It, it was a theory accepted by Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and pretty much most philosophers since then. However, there are others, uh, other theories which we will talk about later. For now, let us explore foundationalism a little bit. It can best be visualized as an upside-down pyramid. The bottom of the image shows us the super tiny point of basic beliefs on the shoulders of which all other knowledge can be built off of. I'm sure that many of you have heard of, well, René Descartes' famous cogito ergo sum, or in English, I think, therefore I am. Well, let me give you a whirlwind tour of how that statement came to be. You see, up to the time of Descartes, Aristotelianism was the overwhelming philosophy that was used to explain, well, pretty much everything. However, modern science started emerging around then, which threw into question Aristotle's claims of the natural world. This suspicion of those particular uh, parts of Aristotle's work spilled over to encompass all of Aristotle. The sentiment was something as follows. Well, if Aristotle was dead wrong about these things, then he might be wrong about everything. Now, Pay attention to the progression in history that led up to Descartes. First, we had the Protestant Reformation that started in 1517 when Luther na nailed his 95 theses criticizing the Roman Catholic Church to the door of his local church. This threw the church into great disarray. Then we had Copernicus, who put the sun at the center of the universe as opposed to the earth in his book De Revolutionobus Orbius Soelistium in 1543. Then we had Galileo, um, uh, who through his improvements in optics created a telescope that was able to confirm Copernicus's theory. Galileo in 1615 was put in front of the Inquisition for his defense of heliocentrism. In 1686, we had Sir Isaac Newton publish the uh, Philosophia Naturalis Principia Mathematica, the princi uh, mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Now, Descartes operated in the period up to his death in 1650. He died only 36 years before Newton published his work. In 1641, Descartes publishes a book entitled Meditations on First Principles. 
Now that we have the history in place, uh, we can tie it all together. The theology of the Roman Catholic Church is almost pure Aristotelianism. With the Protestant Reformation, the Roman Catholic Church was thrown into disfavor. Copernicus added to this fire, and with Galileo, we saw hard evidence that various parts of Aristotle's natural philosophy were false. Since the Roman Catholic Church is foundationally Aristotelian, the Church suffered a great blow as to the validity of the faith concerning the perceived crumbling of Aristotle's philosophy. Due to these scientific developments, coupled with the scandal of the Protestant Reformation, people started leaving the faith in droves. The church needed some way of recovering its philosophical foothold in light of the developments of the 120 years that had just passed. The story goes that René Descartes was commissioned by the church to take on this challenge of laying out a philosophy not based on Aristotle that would work with the Catholic church. This is where Descartes' book, The Meditations, comes in. In it, Descartes takes the sentiment that existed in his time, you know, the sentiment of absolute skepticism about everything. Descartes would use this skepticism as a starting point. He starts his work by saying that he will throw every single belief he holds into doubt and only believe those things which he can prove to be true and nothing else. Now, I won't go through his whole argument because, well, it's quite long, but I will give you the overview of it. Now that Descartes has thrown all his beliefs into question, he raises the stakes. He also throws into question the possibility of him being able to know anything at all. He does this by saying that perhaps we should imagine that there's a malicious demon out there who makes sure that everything we believe is false, even when we're convinced that it is true. Now, Descartes asserts that if he can find one thing uh, that can be believed, it would not only show that knowledge is possible, but it would also give him a foundation to build from. The exercise that Descartes engages in in the meditations is the most complete example of setting up a foundationalist epistemology as I have encountered so far. Descartes' process is as follows. 1. Throw absolutely everything into doubt. 2. Find a basic belief that is self-evidently true. 3. Build up higher level beliefs from this basic belief. In this process of doubting, he even doubts the existence of himself. Now, I'm going to skip some steps, so if the argument seems flimsy, well, it's because of this. Well, feel free to read the meditations for this full exposition, though. Descartes says that if he is to be anything at all, then he must at least be a thinking thing. But are his thoughts his own, or are his thoughts just things fed to him? Well, if indeed there was a demon that was trying to deceive him about everything, then there surely must be something there to deceive. Therefore, if he is a thinking thing, then he at minimum must exist. And so, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore I am. Now that he has established the basic belief, I exist, Descartes uses this basic belief to first prove the possibility of knowledge, then God, then extension, of meaning the existence of his own body and the existence of the physical world, and so on. Though not obviously demonstrated by my exposition here, the Meditations is also the source of what is referred to as Cartesian dualism. And dualism asserts that the mind and physical things are different substances. Philosophically, uh, dualism raises what is referred to as the mind-body problem. The problem being, how can two different substances interact, as we can clearly see the human mind interacting with the human body. Also, Descartes is typically known as the father of modern philosophy because dualism breaks from the Platonic Aristotelian metaphysics that have governed philosophy up to that point. But let us return to the subject at hand. As we have seen up to this point, foundationalism uh, emerged when we take the thesis of the basic self-justifying belief as a solution to the regress argument. Foundationalism then can be summarized as an epistemological theory that states that a belief that someone holds is ultimately justified if and only if the chain of justified true beliefs eventually terminates at a basic belief. The whole foundationalist system can be visually represented as an upside down pyramid with the base being the narrowest part of the pyramid and constituting the set of basic beliefs on which all other beliefs are built upon. Okay. But earlier I said there are other epistemological systems to justification. Let's go back to the four options we have offered to the regress argument. Those were as follows. 1. 
the regress carries on forever, which makes it an infinite regress. 2. The regress terminates in a false belief. 3. The regress becomes circular. 4. The regress terminates in a basic belief. When we take the fourth position, the regress terminates in a basic belief as the solution, we end up with foundationalism. Now, what would happen if we took the third position as the solution? What would happen if we allow for a belief to be justified through circular reasoning? Well, we end up with coherentism. Prima facie, it would appear that we can't do this because we would be committing a logical fallacy. However, it has been argued that if we take coherence as the test for justification, then in fact we are able to do something like this. Now, coherentism can very easily be understood if we look at a visual representation of it. Now, imagine, uh, imagine to yourself a spider web spun somewhere in the corner of a room. What you see is a set of concentric circles extending outward from a point in the center. Uh, these concentric circles are linked together by linear threads throughout the web. The web represents a coherent system with each node constituting a belief that is supported and justified by the other beliefs within this system. Now, if you want to justify one belief in a coherent system, all you need to do is verify that the belief is coherent with all other beliefs within that system which in turn can create a type of a circular justification, but not in the very naive way we have described before. What is critical within a coherent system is that no belief in the system is in contradiction with any other belief. Coherentism, you know, it's a fairly new entrant in epistemology. It's around uh, 200 years old or so. But let us explore coherentism a little before we put forward any criticisms. First, we are well aware of the animosity between religion and science. Well, it has been put forward by some religious proponents that Christianity, for example, is a coherent system within itself, and that science is a coherent system within itself, and those two should not be mixed because they simply do not play well together. An attempt cannot, and in fact should not, be made to try to justify the Christian coherent system by the scientific coherent system, nor should the scientific coherent system be attempted to be justified by the Christian coherent system. Now, here are two other coherent systems for you to consider. General relativity and quantum mechanics. These two systems do not appear to play well together, yet both these theories seem to fall under the umbrella of science, and there seems to be no uproar about these seemingly incompatible theories both being considered correct. Now, these examples I just gave expose some of the criticisms about coherentism. Is there only one true coherent system? So can general relativity and quantum mechanics be unified? Can seemingly competing coherent systems both be true if no resolutions like Christianity and science and currently general relativity and quantum mechanics? Also, since coherentism only assumes coherence between the beliefs within the system, is there any standard for a coherent system to meet in addition to coherence? And if so, how would this then differ from foundationalism? You see, I'm sure that for many of you, when I said that Christianity is a coherent system, then put it in opposition of science as a competing coherent system, many of you probably, probably immediately dismiss Christianity. But you must ask yourself, why? If you grant that Christianity is internally coherent, because what I have seen, I mean the Roman Catholic setup is internally coherent, then clearly there is some other force at work in your mind screaming at you that coherence cannot be enough to justify a belief. Because if you believe that coherence is enough to justify a belief, then you must immediately conclude that Christianity, being internally coherent, is justified. What I see as the big problem with coherentism is this very scream in the mind of most people. I think they instinctively know there needs to be something more. You know, that a coherent system needs to be anchored in some way. Because one can come up with all sorts of crazy sounding coherent system uh, if one puts one's mind to it. However, coherentism is not all bad. You know, I would say that coherentism would be an excellent measure of the health of a culture. Meaning that a culture is strong and healthy if the beliefs within the culture cohere with each other and are systematically practiced and enforced. Coherentism, however, as an epistemological justification, uh, I, I don't see as very convincing. Okay, 
Now that we have covered foundationalism and coherentism, we have two remaining possible stops in the regress argument. One, the regress carries on forever, which makes it an infinite regress. Two, the regress terminates in a false belief. Now, no epistemological theory exists to my knowledge that asserts that point two, the regress terminates in a false belief, is something that can be worked into a viable theory of knowledge. This leaves point one, the regress carries on forever, which makes it an infinite regress. You know, there actually is an epistemological theory that tries to take this path. It is called infinitism. Yeah, infinitism is not popular nor well developed, so I won't speak of it. However, if you are interested in infinitism, you please feel free to investigate it on your own. The last two theories of knowledge I want to present to you are skepticism and relativism. Now, I don't want you to think about the skeptic community or anything like that when thinking about skepticism. Philosophical skepticism has nothing to do with what those people believe. The only thing philosophical skepticism has in common with the skeptic community is the word skepticism. So then, what is philosophical skepticism? Well, philosophical skepticism is the belief that nothing can be known, including the truth of that statement itself. Finally, relativism. This, in a nutshell, I would call, at its worst, rationalization hamster epistemology. Skepticism and relativism, well, are both very involved subjects, which I plan on doing one video on each at some point in the future, and so won't really cover them here. I'm just letting you, you know, letting you know that they exist. So to sum it up, foundationalism is the oldest epistemic theory of justification and has been the prevailing theory even up to now. Coherentism emerged in the last 200 years or so as a competing theory, but as we have seen, coherentism has a number of problems associated with it. Then there's the relatively obscure infinitism, and finally skepticism and relativism. Now, try this exercise for yourself. Pick a belief you have and try to trace it back to a basic belief. You know, this is like playing the five-year-old's game of why. Pick something substantial, you know, something like, uh, uh, I believe God exists, why? Or, I believe that God does not exist, why? You know, try to trace it back as far as it will go. And then when you get to the end of your justification, ask yourself, is the final belief a basic belief? Is this belief self-justifying, you know, self-evident? Most people give up, you know, about four or five questions in. So this would sound something like, like the following. Um, does God exist? Uh, and we'll pick the side of, no, God does not exist. So I do not believe in God. Why? Because there's no evidence of God. Why do I believe there's no evidence of God? Because the thesis of God is in, uh, not falsifiable. Why do I believe that falsifiability is important? Well, here I kind of have to stop because I'd have to actually look up the details of this argument. But you kind of see what I mean when, when, when going with this exercise of trying to trace back one of your beliefs down to a basic belief. It gets really difficult really quickly. But for now, thanks for listening. Go team.